time to talk Africa. Welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. This week we focus on matters of identity. The big question we're asking, how do you identify yourself and why? And what does that mean for your community, your society, your country and the world at large? We also get your views on the issues and we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. On the show this week, we focus on matters of identity critical across Africa. Our panelists, Mwangela Kamenchu is with us. He's a historian and an artist. We also have with us Zarina Patel, best known for saving Nairobi's Jivanji Gardens. She's the managing editor of Awaz magazine and co-founder of the Samosa Festival. Also with us is Margareta Wagasheru, a writer who has had a 40-year love affair with Kenya and has seven degrees under her belt. Our focus this week is identity. Mm -hmm. And there are so many different ranges of identity from ethnicity to religion, race, career. But how do you identify yourself? I think the most basic of them all, a human being, humanity, um, not wanting to be part of um, something that would perpetuate suffering, oppression, and that sort of thing. So I think that is, at the most basic level, I'm a human being first. Then you can come off as, you know, an artist, um, uh, occupational, of course. You can talk about ethnicity. You can talk about nationality. You can talk about an African um, in terms of the location, not only the location as well as the race, but in terms of the location as Africa, as an African, someone living in Africa. So I guess um, those are some of the things I identify myself with. That's powerful because yeah. what it does, it gives you a foundation and a common understanding with every other human. Yes, I believe it does. Thank you so much. Zarina, how do you identify yourself? My identity is being a Kenyan. And I think it's uh, an urbanized Kenyan. I, I did for a few years try living in the rural areas. And then we were attacked by uh, burglars twice and told that we had to get out of there. And I was so glad and thanked them that I came back to the city. And that's where I belong. <laughs> because you didn't enjoy the rural no. area. But let me ask you this question. Do you think you were attacked twice because of their perception of your identity? Yes, I think so. Interesting. Margareta, you've lived in Kenya for 40 years. So how do you identify yourself now? People see a mzungu. And I can tell you how often on the street, children will say, mzungu, mzungu. Yeah? And I don't identify like that. I really don't. I mean, I know that yeah, I can't ex escape it. And I can't escape the fact that I'm an American uh, by birth. And I have a legacy that I am actually quite proud of um, from my background. But uh, Kenya is definitely number one in my heart. And again, as um, I, I am a Christian, and so there's a part of me that is very secret that I don't talk about, but I really do see myself as a child of God. And I feel that, you know, this is, this is how I relate to people. This is the freedom I have. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's the truth about me. So interesting, we've had three different perspectives, but mine connects with many of yours, but primarily I identify myself as a, as a child of God as well. Now, identity is a rich and a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. but is also the source of plenty of conflict. And this is why we're coming down to this discussion. And in a highly globalized world where more and more we are reaching out, intermingling and understanding each other more, we're seeing radicalism rise. And we are seeing some of those divisions get even more dangerous. So my question next is, in Africa, how can we ensure that rather than exacerbating conflicts because of identity, we are able to start connecting, cooperating more? Mwangela, what do you think? Uh, okay, I don't really think identity per se is the root cause of conflict and that sort of thing. I think there are other structural problems that should be addressed. And, and once you take care of that, identity becomes something that um, 
you don't really, you, you don't really, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, Let's talk about the structural yeah. problems. What do you see as the root causes, the main root causes, particularly in Africa? Particularly in Africa, I'd say, um, I'd say the struggle for economic resources and self-interest. When you have, I'll give a number of examples. Um, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, um, there was this um, civil war um, in, in the 90s, and, 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 and we, had, we had a class called Ivoilite, which were immigrants from surrounding areas, um, Burkina Faso, that sort of thing, that, were, that, that came in to work on cocoa plantations and that sort of thing. And you had the so-called indigenous people of Cote d'Ivoire, and they'd refer to these other immigrants as Ivoilite, almost 25% of the population. And it became a weapon that the political elite would use. More or less what really happened in, in, in Kenya and what has happened over some periods of history, saying that they versus us, you know, it's some um, sort of um, siege mentality. We're all under attack, so we have to close ranks and that sort of thing. So I wouldn't really say that um, identity is a key thing. I'd say self-interest, collapse it against um, the struggle for, for, you know, gaining economic resources and, 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 and trying to benefit out of it, I think that is at the center of, of all of this, in my opinion. Thank you for that. So very yeah. short-term thinking and selfish political interests yeah. is, is what takes us to that place. Yeah. Yeah. Zarina, let me come to you, and I want to move the conversation slightly um, to the Asian community, particularly in East Africa. We have an Asian community that came decades ago and settled here and has lived and has become part and parcel of what we are as Africa. Um, but very often we see a resistance towards getting involved in politics. Um, why is this, do you think, and, and is it time that that changes? Well, <clears throat> first of all, to qualify that, um, in the colonial times, mm -hmm. Asians were right in the forefront of politics. They were, they were. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was journalists, whether it was lawyers, uh, politicians for that matter, also. Okay? So it's really for, uh, after independence that this happened. That this happened. Mm -hmm. Um, I, th I, th I think there are several reasons. I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, our early um, uh, uh, governance in this country did not foster um, people, uh, bringing people together and allowing them uh, to take their, their, their role, their role uh, in society. And in fact, many of the Asians who had worked so hard, like Makhan Singh, Ambulal Patel, all these people, Pio Gama Finto, uh, in the colonial times, were sidelined mm -hmm. uh, post-independent. So I think that is a major thing. And it's not just Asians. I mean, I think our whole ethnic problem really started uh, post-independence. So let's talk about marginalized communities generally. Yeah. And we're even talking about marginalization of majorities like youth, <laughs> like women. And, and then we're talking about marginalized communities, the Asian community, but many, many others looking at northern Kenya and the situation there, you know, parts of the coastal areas of this country. What do you think is the solution to, to, to situations like this? I, I think it's very basic. I think it's what Mangela said. It's the whole huge class differences that we have created in this in this country, and and that and when that happens, when uh, segments of society feel that they are not really fully part of this country, mm -hmm. uh, and they are not getting their rights, they then retreat into their cocoons and begin to uh, make their demands within their communities and their cocoons, whether they're ethnic or religious or race or whatever. Thank you for that. Let me come to you, Margareta. And having grown up in the, in the US, you know, we talk about a lot of problems in Africa as though they are you know, uh, common only to ourselves. But, but ethnic identity, identity, the question of identity, obviously, even in the Western world, is, is a huge issue. What do you want to see leaders doing better to address this? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I, I agree with the, our, our, my previous speakers that uh, socioeconomic, economic issues are fundamental. And I think, um, first and foremost, I think the leaders need to have a, a, a much larger sense of what leadership is, what their responsibility is to serve. I mean, they're public servants. 
and they don't look after the public. We see so much working for me, 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 and not working for the people. So if you were really working for the people, you would be thinking, first and foremost, how can I make sure they have an education? How can I make sure that there's equity at all levels of the society? So that we open up opportunities for people, because I do think that we have a incredible youth who are very gifted in Kenya. And um, but it is the case that you know whether it's being marginalized or whatever, people don't want to um, give of themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, some, the rich can only understand that enough is not enough. So I think that whole, again, we were talking before, mentality. There needs to be a mentality shift and a realization that y you have a responsibility. If you're in a position of leadership, that's what, when you have to give it away, really, and share. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Let me, let me come now to the floor with this question of identity and the complexity around identity. What are your thoughts on this? And particularly how to ensure that we don't have emerging conflicts um, that arise from not necessarily questions of identity, perhaps uh, resource issues, perhaps other issues, but fueled uh, across identity. It's very simple. When when with a society where leaders can actually tell the, the buttons to push to make you vote for them or, vote, or make you do what they want, where our, you actually embarrass about your identity, where if somebody asks you, yo, you're from this side, you're like, yo, no, no, no. Because we've been, there's this thought, train of thought that we've been taught now that you actually, you're embarrassed to be from a specific community or a specific tribe. That you tribe is no longer your identity, but it's like a burden. Where if you could not, if you could have a different name where no one knows where you're from, you feel much more comfortable because you're afraid if, you, if somebody realizes you're from somewhere, you feel embarrassed. And that goes down to leadership because our leaders are not selfless. Not only they want to come, come out and be iconic, do something for the people, unite the people. Our leader wants to come in five to 20 years, whatever, or even 30 years if they can, make as much money, leave the country worse than we found it, but they won't care. They don't want to leave money. Then people say, you remember that guy who did this? They don't really care. It's about how much money can I make? How, how can my people go further? And so it's all about the leaders learning your weakness and sort of using it against us. So let me throw a spanner in the works. What if the most qualified end up being mainly from one, whichever community it may be, what if the most qualified end up being then, uh, you know, so it's, it's complex. It is a balancing act, mm -hmm. and I think it is a, it is an act of affirmation that, is, that when you when you have affirmation that looks at you may have many people qualified, but you got to be just as well. Right. And it is not possible to, to say that you can only get you the most qualified. Certainly, merit should be a factor, mm -hmm. but it cannot be the overriding and dominant factor in terms of running. Thank you so much for that, Zahid. Let's come back to the panel with thoughts from um, uh, what you've heard from our audience members. Mungela. The problems we have are not only particular to a political elite, in my opinion. We, you look at different organizations, trade unions, um, student politics, media, you ask yourself, are they, are, they, um, are, they, are they much better, or are they, would they have the moral authority um, when you compare them to the political elite? And more or less you find representations, microcosms of, of really the same representation of what you're seeing in the political elite right. in these in this various um, non-state actors, if you prefer. Right. So the question then becomes, as a direct result of this, are there individuals who are willing to steer this country or this continent um, in, 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 in a means, in a way that would prevent oppression and that sort of thing and conflict and that sort of thing? So I'm born to a culture. So naturally, there are certain things that I take up. So I'm not perfect, just like everyone else. So I believe these individuals who will put themselves forward and say, okay, the I Mongelas. believe... The Mongelas. You've said it. Yes. Um, <laughs> if, if these individuals put themselves forward and say, okay, I will chart a different path mm. 
that would, would, would set up a society that is based on humanity, in which um, uh, levels of oppression are minimi minimalized, and, and you raise a collective consciousness, mm -hmm. you educate people, you talk to them, you share with them, not really educate, but also learn from them. Mm -hmm. and, and from that, from that uh, mobilization and from that engagement with people, um, telling them and, and learning from them and learning how we can identify as human beings, not so much, from, not so much as our ethnic communities or our, or, or our classes and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, mm -hmm. I think that would chart the right path Thank for you. this continent, in my opinion. Powerful. Yes. Thank you, Thank Zahina. You. I, I think we have two very basic problems, very basic. Uh, one is that we are still, I think, semi-colonized, uh, what they call neo-colonial. Mentally? Okay? Yes. Mm. And I think we, uh, our mindset is still from the colonial times mm. where the, 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 the white person, the Western person was the leader, the, 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 you know, the, the, the people who made the decisions. And we had to follow. And we've kind of translated that now, that the government and the rich up there are our leaders, and we just have to follow. Mm. So we have that problem. But we also have the problem of, and I think it's a, a problem of the capitalist system, that our values are totally upside down. Huh? We think that it is the top 20%, those rich, upper middle class, bourgeoisie, whatever, who do the development and the mm. growth of this country. But actually, it is the, it is the 80%. Mm. I mean, where would you and I and all be if we didn't have the farmers, you know, who feed us? Who, if we didn't have our plumbers and electricians and mechanics to run our lives? There's nothing we'd be doing. We wouldn't be existing, mm. you know. Mm. But we, everybody thinks it's the other way around. How do we transform? How do we achieve a mind shift? We need to, uh, to uh, those, and, the, and I think, I don't think I'm the only person who believes this, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of people in society. We need to speak up more, we need to learn this more, and we have to educate our fellow human beings right. about mm -hmm. the reality. Your thoughts, Margaret? Oh my gosh. Well, I think that what has been said before is, is really relevant. Uh, the colonial era really went out of its way recognizing the value of culture and the, because of the indigenous morality that was there, uh, we, we disseminate, we uh, demolish that. We negate people's identity and culture so that we can manipulate them more easily. And as you say, it's a carryover. The colonialism, we cannot uh, say, oh, it's over. Everything started, the mess started in 1963. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. I do think that there is a culture that is pervasive, that is, whether you want to call it capitalist, I, I think it's a culture of money. And the unfortunate thing is that people look up to um, thieves, somebody who's rich, a rich man. Hey, look at that car he's got. Eh? Look at that house he's got. Eh? Look at all those uh, bling bling things he's got. <laughs> uh? And so I think um, that is uh, that is what has to change. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's very difficult because people, it, it's very persuasive. You know, I see, hey, don't you look beautiful today? That's a beautiful, you know, how much did that cost? Where did you get it? You know. And uh, so I think the materialism mm. is a part of the misfortune that people, they want, and, and I don't blame people, especially people who have been held down through the colonial experience, to want a better life. But then there's a question of how you do it. And this is the question of empowerment. And I think that, you know, the realization that we have tremendous human capacity and resources among the Kenyan people themselves. Really, I think leaders need to listen more. Um, to, and, and, and that's the problem, because if we don't have that selflessness, that willingness to be responsive to the needs of the people, you're not going to listen to them. But we, we also need, as you said, um, Kenyans to be more outspoken. I think that um, I think that there was a, a time the pre the the Mau Mau War 
the, the subjugation, I mean, the cruelty that the colonizer inflicted on the people, the violence that they saw, I think sometimes people just don't want to encounter that violence. Mm -hmm. And of course, 2007, 2008 reinforced the idea that you don't want that. Don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. But we do want change. And I think that people can, there are a lot of avenues where people can be expressive of their needs and their demands. You know, I almost feel like we've just tapped into this topic, and yet we've got to wind this session up. Very interesting views from you all. Thank you so much. What are your words of advice to the African leadership and citizenry? Um, African leadership, um, presidents, ministers, and so on. Um, are you a human being? Do you identify as a human being? Do you identify with your humanity? If that is the case, you wouldn't um, accumulate for yourself while a number of citizens are suffering. You would do something to lift your populations out of poverty. You do something to empower them. You would um, invest in education to make the people have a critical consciousness of the society that they're living in and to also enable them to create opportunities for themselves to develop their se themselves and that sort of thing. Um, to the African youth, identify with humanity. I think that is the most basic piece of advice I can give, um, or at least um, what I think is advice. Um, so I believe you, as a human being, oppression really, you wouldn't want to see another human being suffer, whether or not he's from a different ethnic community, race, and that sort of thing. So that is my advice to all of you. I would like to talk about the idea of leadership. We are always talking about the leaders should do this, that, the other, a problem with the leaders. But I, I think all of us, we really are leaders in our own right, okay? I mean, my own family, I'm a leader, okay? So I, I think there's something that each of us can do, definitely, on this whole problem of, uh, of ethnic and racial conflict and religious conflict. Um, is how are we socializing our children? How do we talk in our house when we sit around the dinner table? Do we talk about those windies who are all exploiters? Mm. Do we talk about those kikuyus who are, who are all thieves? Or do we say that person is a thief or that person is exploiting? Mm. So it, this thing of what can I do, you know, we don't have the right government. I, do, I don't buy that at all. I think each of us can be doing something. And particularly on the religious front, okay, because I think that's a huge problem that is only arising now uh, in, in our countries. Um, I think it's very, very important to, one, realize that, or to accept that religion is a personal thing. We don't have to go to war about religion, you know. I think that uh, as someone who's come to this country and really appreciates the country, and that's why I have lived here so long. I mean, I have had my times when I come and go, but I, I think uh, sometimes I feel that outsiders love Kenya and Kenyans more than Kenyans love themselves. It's so do bizarre. You, do you think that's the same across many parts of Africa? Uh, no, I so don't. So it's unique I to different countries. I think Kenya is unique. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've tried to figure out why. Um, I mean, is it the climate? Is the fact that we, you know, it's so cold, you know, but, but I mean, normally, um, uh, but I do think Kenya is unique because Kenyans, for better or worse, they've, they've learned, you know, we keep talking about divisiveness, and I do feel that people need to transcend their narrow identities mm -hmm. and really appreciate themselves as Kenyans, as Africans, as whatever they want to identify with, but the element of tolerance needs to be there, and appreciation of self. People have to love themselves in order to love other people. And that's why I'm saying, I think it's amazing how many Wazungus I hear, they, they come and they decide that they've got to stay. And you know, it's just, I mean, it's I, at least one a week. I've heard of, or more, people who just say that I, we you know. Yeah. I mean, there was one, I think, ambassador that married a Maasai lady just so that he could hang out here. <laughs> <laughs> the former U.S. ambassador to Canada, yes. You know. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Margareta. Um, and it's an incredible conversation. So love yourself so you can love others. And, and possibly what you're saying to us as well is appreciate what you have. Take a moment to truly understand what you have and appreciate. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Time to get your views now on the issues. This week we asked you, how can we interface the different levels of African identity and citizenship? Micheni Allen says, Education will play a big role. If, for example, we had a common text that everyone on the continent interacted with, the commonality of something that can't be touched. Also, cultural festivals that go out of their way to invite cultures perceived to be different. Gidhuku James Kinyanjui says, There is need to raise the level of education, sensitizing the masses on Pan-Africanism and the need to front our diversity causes, changing our mindset and having a media that portrays positive diversity. We need to create forums to advance the African cause. My name is Jade Makori. I'm from West Mugirango County, Nyanza Province. My opinion concerning the interfacing of the different African identities and citizenship is we should first embrace that we should have a sort of common language and we're all from different backgrounds so we should embrace that and we should also acknowledge that we all have um, this historical background that sort of makes us different from the rest and thus we should embrace it. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. If you want to continue this conversation, you can go to www.samosafestival.com where all these conversations are ongoing around issues of class, ethnicity, religion, so much more. So get into the conversation with us. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature the top mindset challenges facing Africa. Starting us off at number 10 is the crab mentality. If you put several crabs into a bucket and one begins to crawl out, several other crabs will pull it down and prevent its escape. It's called crab mentality. Africans must overcome this and unite with a focus on creating strong networks that support each other. Coming in at number 9 is lack of international intelligence. Many Africans have a limited understanding of the globalized world they are living in and the forces and trends that are shaping it. This lack of intelligence renders them reactionary. Africans must be informed, aware, proactive and plan in order to shape their own destiny. At number 8 is the lack of science and engineering education. Studies show colonial powers tended to drastically reduce the study of science and engineering in the countries they occupied. They would favor the arts, developing graduates just good enough to assist them in running the colonies or occupied territories. Africa certainly needs more scientists and engineers focused on development, innovation and research. Position at number 7 is a lack of domestic leadership education. For any society to prosper, it requires a structure for identifying, training and coaching future leaders. Individually, there are many brilliant people across Africa. However, collectively, they often fail to work together harmoniously on long-term vision and commit with integrity and loyalty to their country. The rich subaltern mentality comes in at number six. Young people aspire to emulate the most successful models in their society and the only visible and tangible models available is the rich subaltern model, the junior officer and the middle manager. However, middle managers don't create companies, they don't create value, they don't create jobs and they don't invent, innovate or act in leadership position with the power to change things. It is a challenge to develop a country or continent where the majority of people who have the potential to become leaders are raised to be good subalterns. At number five is ignorance of the books of Machiavelli, Hegel and Darwin on models and strategies for leadership. 
Their strategies have influenced many developed countries and ignorance of these principles by which the Western elite think and act is a major cause of naivety and incompetence across Africa. Taking the number four spot is the colonial borders. African borders are far from ideal, creating barriers between homogeneous communities and building challenges for integration and trade. However, ongoing efforts by several African countries to ease movement of people and large cross-border infrastructure development initiatives are addressing this challenge. Slotted in at number three is international media. Western media seems to follow a largely singular script with respect to African nations and populations, constantly framing Africa as a conflict-driven, desperate continent. The influence of Western media impacts even on localized African media houses who cover stories in other African nations using the international media lens. To address this, African media should invest in Africa coverage and seek a deeper understanding of both the challenges and opportunities on the continent. Positioned at number two is international aid. If foreign aid was a key factor for development, then Africa should be the most developed continent in the world. It is certainly a challenge to develop any country when the dream of the majority of its youth and citizenry is not entrepreneurship, innovation, education and self-sufficiency, but over-reliance on assistance and aid. And our number one this week is the poverty porn. Humanitarian organizations based in Africa have engaged in poverty porn depicting Africa through the most degrading and humiliating images to raise money for their operations. This impacts negatively on African self-image, feeds the dependency syndrome, and weakens the self-confidence and resolve of many Africans. It also contributes significantly to the scorn and racism Africans often face globally. To move from these challenges may not be easy, but it's certainly possible for all those determined to move the continent forward. And that's Africa's Top 10 this week. And it's time to close the show. Already, as always, we have wise words for you as we end the show. And this time we have an African proverb. If you give bad food to your stomach, it drums for you to dance. <laughs> what are you feeding yourselves? Blessings to you and blessings to Africa. Thank you. <laughs>